Hey, so we're almost complete. Yeah? Yeah, he worried. He worried. Yeah. We need more. He worried yeah. because he worried show up, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Nice to meet you. That's very nice. So, we have enough chairs. We have enough chairs, yeah. Maybe. Then. One year and a half. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased that with a slight delay, we are starting this uh, distinguished panel. Um, I think we only have half an hour, 40 minutes left, so the entire program will then be squeezed. Um, my name is Wolfgang Kopf. I'm heading public and regulatory at Deutsche Telekom. And I'm really pleased to have such a distinguished panel um, in order to speed up things. Everybody who speaks introduces himself. Um, otherwise, we are losing too much time. Um, the questions we are discussing here are twofold. The first question is, how should we deal with constantly upcoming new threats for the technical core of the internet? That's all about IGF. And the second one is, what legal regulations and capacity building approaches do we need? So it's about technology and it's about international law and maybe also national law. Um, I know we have a variety of experts here who cover both. Um, we will start with Professor Weidner from Fraunhofer. Where is he? He next to me, sorry. <laughs> we have no seating order. Um, and before he starts, let me give you just a few facts about cyber threats. Um, we at Deutsche Telekom operate one of the biggest cybersecurity centers in Europe. The head is over there. Um, employing almost 2,000 people. And what we are doing there is also we are constantly monitoring um, the attacks which are seen in the internet. We use so-called honeypots, that's uh, small devices simulating to be um, a vulnerable device in our network. Of course, they are not, but we detect the attacks. And what's your estimate about um, a daily average day in terms of attacks? I'm not asking somebody. The average is currently about 50 million per day attacks on these devices. In peak, it's 100 million per day. If you then look at recent figures, um, Bitcom, the German association of uh, digitized companies just um, published some figures. Only in Germany, the damage from cyber um, crime is 100 billion euros per year. And um, three out of four companies in Germany have already experienced data theft, espionage, or other threats uh, coming from the cyber. 
If you then look at the recent uh, World Economic Forum report, their estimate is six trillion, trillion dollars in 2021 of damage worldwide coming from cyber. So that gives us an idea how economically important this subject is, but I leave it with that, and Professor Weidler, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for... No, this was wrong. Is it still wrong? No, it's not. So, so what I would like to do, what I'm going to do in the next uh, few minutes is actually setting the stage for what are the threats at the core internet infrastructure. And to introduce myself quickly, so you see I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a professor for, for cybersecurity at TU Darmstadt, but at the same time I'm heading the main cybersecurity institute of Fraunhofer Society. Fraunhofer Society is Germany's largest organization for applied research with like 28,000 employees. And I'm also heading the newly founded National Research Center for Applied Cybersecurity Athene with some 500 researchers in, in Darmstadt. So a lot of capacity for doing security research. And actually what I'm going to talk about is one of the main topics in this new center. So what are the key challenges for security and safety and for stability and resilience? And what you see on the right is kind of a, of a mini Mickey Mouse stack. You have cybercrime, industrial espionage, disinformation, which is targeting applications, of course. Underneath are the internet applications, and at the very bottom is the core internet infrastructure, which is what I'm going to talk about. So typically, attacks, hacks, are coming from all sides, but they typically exploit weaknesses, problems at the bottom. And what are these weaknesses? That's what you see on the left. These three, and I'm going to talk about each like for one minute. So the first one is establishing ownership over resources. And this is actually something that everybody here is experiencing. So if you want to do anything over the internet, you would like to know who is the other side, who is the other party. How can you identify them? And on the internet, most people would say, of course, that's a PKI problem. There's the web PKI for something like um, SSL, TLS. There is resource PKI, RPKI for something like routing. And the problem with all of this is, and it's very typical for the challenge here, so um, there are methods to identify the other side very reliably. So if I want to get a certificate and I want to do it very securely, I do organizational validation, extended validation, a lot of paperwork, very expensive, very slow, so nobody's using it. Everybody's using domain validation. I'm saying, hey, I'm Michael, you sent me an email, if it receives me, then it was me. And the problem is, this doesn't work. So there are attacks and we can actually show that essentially all of the main PKIs in the web, in the internet, can be attacked and can be tricked into issue VOCUS certificates. The same is for RPKI, for ownership in registries, and many other problems. So one problem is really establishing ownership over resources. There are solutions for this, I have to say, but they have to be deployed, of course. And deployment is always a problem. The second challenge is something like the eternal challenge in the internet, secure routing and secure naming. So one is mostly BGP, the other one is DNS and BGP prefix hijacking. So I send a message not through the correct route, but I reroute it somehow, so that I, as an attacker, can intercept it. This is a well-known problem. There are solutions to it. RPKI would play a big role in it, but actually, we also checked this. We did a lot of statistics and measurements in the internet, and it happens thousands of times. Prefix hijacking, rerouting, and it's still an open problem. Same for DNS. DNS is the naming system in the internet. So if you want to reach me, michael.com, so to speak, then someone has to tell you who that is. And this thing is the domain name system. And we checked like 75% of all company networks are vulnerable against something called cache poisoning, and you would end up somewhere. So again, together with uh, forging certificates and influencing DNS, I can essentially redirect you to anywhere I want. So this is, again, an open problem. Again, there are solutions to it, like DNSSEC, like 10, 20 years old. We checked this as well, of course, and with DNSSEC, the problem is deploying cryptography, configuring cryptography is still a big challenge. Many administrators get it wrong, and we found out that like two-thirds of all DNSSEC installations are simply not providing any security. And the third challenge is on availability, performance, and stability, and here you see one example. I'm sorry for the German here, but what it essentially says is that we did a very simple experiment 
where we try to measure a few things in the internet, and we did this by using some usually not used flags in, in TCP. And problem is, routers didn't behave well. Instead of doing what they should do, they, many of them simply crashed, and people figured out that actually by just using standard protocols and doing something that is not so common, you can do the perfect denial of service attack. So no need to have a botnet, you just send the messages and that's it. And what it shows you is that actually the internet, this basic core infrastructure is very fragile. Um, we need to find ways to figure out what, the, what devices are there, what is the software, what is the hardware that, that is used, and we have to find ways to more quickly deploy better solutions. So again, this, are the, this is the third challenge. And uh, so this was setting a stage. I told you the, the world is, so to speak, bad. Of course, research is providing many, many solutions. And um, if you are interested in what we are doing, so there is a mission in Athene, this National Research Center, analytics-based cybersecurity headed by Dr. Haya Schulman. You can check it on the internet, what we are doing there. But I think these three are the fundamental challenges and solutions are there. Deploying them is really difficult, time-consuming. There's a lot of work to be done. And with this, I hand it back to the moderator. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Weidner. Um, I think our next uh, guest who will speak is um, the Secretary General of the ITU, and his theme will be rather the global framework, as I understand. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Uh, let me, if by uh, you know, appreciating uh, Deutsche Telekom first. You know, uh, people know that uh, I was director of a standardization bureau elected by ITU in 1998. So 1999, February, I started my office. And at that moment, I received the Deutsche Telekom uh, high-level delegation uh, led by your board members with the technical guys you know, to ask a shuttle service to, July, uh, to, to, to Geneva. We spent one day to talk about that. And at that moment, of course, there are many operators in the world. But I'm very pleased to know that uh, 20 years after uh, that meeting, Deutsche Telekom is still very strong, and Deutsche Telekom become even stronger. You know that uh, in, it's one of a few still remaining very active uh, international carriers, not only the German carriers. Uh, well, when you, you just mentioned that uh, I'd like to talk uh, international uh, framework. Of course, uh, international telecommunication was uh, created in 1865 by 20 European states, and among 20 European states, there's no Germany, because Germany did not exist. But then we had uh, seven German states. So if you talk about uh, German membership, you know that <laughs> you know, we have one third of uh, founding members from Germany. And we worked from the very beginning to talk about the security. And the telecom take security very seriously. From tele first the tele telegraph network, then telecommunication network, uh, and the telecommunication satellite. So we are working very hard. But however, in 1998, we realized that the telecom security cannot be discussed, uh, limited to the telecom engineers. And we have to engage a you know, multi-stakeholder approach to engage many people. So that uh, ITU invited the United Nations to organize the World Summit Information Society in 2003, first in Geneva, and then 2005 in Tunis. And then the IGF is one of the output of this WISIS process. And uh, at that uh, second phase, IT was interested to take care of uh, uh, facilitator rules on the cybersecurity. You know, IT has been working on this for years. And recently, we uh, even strengthen our work on the security, cyber security, in particular in the artificial intelligence areas and in the cloud computing. So we established some Fox group to look at this issue. Now this technical issue, but also IT is working with our members to, you know, to try to increase the capacity, uh, knowledge about the cyber security and the capacity building of uh, cyber security. And we have a lot of uh, partnership with uh, many people. So I don't, uh, I uh, want to, you know, you know to uh, go too much detail. But anyhow, over the last 10 years, we established the global cybersecurity agenda. And later by a very famous uh, expert from Norway, uh, he's a lawyer. And then we developed this agenda. I was very pleased to know that uh, at PP18, this uh, global cybersecurity agenda was further confirmed, uh, preceded by an ideal family that uh, we could continue to, to use that uh, 
output its guidelines to help us to strengthen our cooperation with our members. I, I think that uh, Ambassador Robert uh, Strayer was there at, at the head of uh, American delegation. We appreciate very much, uh, you know, his personal roles to support uh, us with, with this kind of work. And last but not least, you know, when we talk about this uh, uh, new technology of 5G, I'm very pleased to share with you that uh, uh, last four weeks, we had our meeting in Shamashink. We talked about uh, world radio communication business. And I was very honored to receive a letter from uh, President Trump to facilitate uh, our meeting and encourage ITU to continue to play its uh, convenient rules to usage of uh, spectrum. And the spectrum is absolutely important. You know, when we, we have the next uh, technology of 5G, we next the technology of uh, the one way in the side, in the sky, aero uh, internet, and talking about uh, strengthening our cooperations with new technologies. And of course, uh, you know, we are very encouraged uh, by President Trump's uh, message with our conference. And I was very pleased that we finished this conference uh, Friday last week, and very successful. And we have enough uh, spectrum to support uh, the deployment of 5G everywhere. And we also have uh, established some groups to talk about uh, security issues. I also, in my message, uh, reply to uh, President Trump that uh, you know, we encourage the United States to play its leading roles to these new technologies and also invite uh, our uh, US experts to come to join ITU's activities to develop uh, global standards for the security so that uh, serves the purpose to satisfy everybody, including our American friends, and then to meet uh, uh, you know that the expectation of uh, end users for the uh, security concerns because it's them who really help us to use cyberspace and we have to provide uh, sufficient uh, measures to increase their confidence to use the cyber cyberspace so, so that is my short short remarks so thank you very thank much thank you very much <coughs> rob there was a lot of themes already maybe you want um, to take over. Rob Strayer is um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber Matters in the US. So well known to us Europeans. Uh, you're, you're spending more time over here than in the US, I think. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, thanks for including me on your panel. And um, uh, Secretary General Zhao, yeah, I want to congratulate you on completing that uh, World Radio Communications Conference, uh, which has identified now more than 15 gigahertz for uh, 5G spectrum, which is going to be so important to economic growth around the world and to see a harmonized use of that spectrum. Um, you know, this is a propitious time as we are uh, now just passing the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Internet. Uh, in that time, the Internet has faced many challenges, and those challenges have been addressed by multi-stakeholder institutions that have grown up over that time. Um, organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IEEE, most recently in the last decade or 15 years, the uh, IGF, uh, also ICANN for the domain name system. So we've seen these institutions develop to address uh, challenges. Now we're going to see, hopefully very soon, the next three billion people connected to the internet, probably a trillion new devices connected through the internet of things uh, in the next couple decades, as well as every important sector of our economy becoming more digitized and therefore reliant on the internet and for secure connections. So that means that we need to continue to strengthen and revitalize these important multi-stakeholder institutions to address those very significant challenges of the future. As we do so, we need to keep in mind what's made it successful so far, and that is having a very successful innovation base uh, in a set of policies that have allowed innovation to bring us uh, so much uh, positive development, improve people's standard of living, and connect so many people around the world. And that innovation has been allowed to happen because we've taken a light touch set of regulation using flexible and uh, efficient regulatory postures so that we're not stifling future innovation. Uh, in the United States, our vision is to have an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet for future generations. Uh, in part, to do so, it's important to ensure that we have the confidence and trust of public and businesses in avoiding some of these uh, issues with, related to cyber uh, intrusions and cyber vulnerabilities of the systems. I think it's very important that we advance a framework of responsible state behavior for the actions of nation states so that nation states do not undertake malicious behavior in cyberspace. Uh, we 
along with a number of other nations through the UN and actually endorsed by the UN General Assembly have supported a framework of responsible state behavior that includes recognizing that international law applies in cyberspace just as it does in the real world and there are certain norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace and those include that a nation should not attack another nation's critical infrastructure that is providing services to the public. Uh, we saw uh, at the, on the sidelines this last September of the UN High Level Week, 28 countries come together to say that we support this framework of responsible state behavior and that states that act inconsistent with it and contrary to it should be held accountable and, in, and to further that accountability to in, at times impose consequences for states that act in malicious ways. Um, you know, and I think it's also important, uh, one last point to really uh, bring home here is, it, you know, we need to address all these technical vulnerabilities between uh, border gateway protocol compromises to DNS poisoning. But fundamentally, because we're in a software-based system, any software can be updated instantaneously to, in it, to push forward new vulnerabilities and new compromises to systems. Therefore, we really need to have a trust relationship with the vendors for our most critical technologies. In the case of something like 5G, the fifth generation wireless technology, that will support artificial intelligence and all types of critical infrastructure, including the distribution of electricity, we must have the highest standards of trust with those vendors. And so the United States is encouraging countries around the world to adopt trust frameworks that include looking at whether the company is headquartered in a country where it has to comply with the rule of law and has an independent judiciary in place to ensure that it adheres to our most fundamental human rights, including uh, protection of free speech and freedom of association. A vendor that's not in a, fr in a system where it complies with the rule of law and there's an independent judiciary to vindicate those rights is one that we cannot trust with our most precious data that will be generated on 5G systems. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Well, what's the view of a smaller state? I think Minister Salazar is, uh, is well placed to, to give us some insights. Uh, you got a background in engineering, so you're talking um, not only politics, but you would be also able to comment on the details. So please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Luis. I am the Minister of Science, Technology, and Telecommunication of Costa Rica. It's very important when we talk about cybersecurity because we are talking about people. We are talking about children. We are talking about all the people that uh, live in vulnerable areas. So my message is that we want to improve all that we are doing under two concepts. The first of all is to gender equality and protect the child. So that we are trying to do it, promote the culture to cybersecurity for computer science, coordinate the national level and international level, that this is very important to work together, that allow the general improve the cyber and computer security, and support administrative and judicial authorities in the appropriate case for the investigation and prosecution of perpetrator of cybersecurity and computer crimes. That we are talking is that we live in a global world. And everybody each day have more connected devices. We have to manage a spectrum polit uh, public policies. We are talking about innovation. We are talking about how can we uh, make more democratized the access to internet. However, the most important thing is not to talk about the technical skills. I know that all the technical skills, I am a, an engineer. But the most important thing is to talk about the benefit of the risks of the people. The center of all of the discussion must to be the people. If we don't work having the people in the center, we will have a big and a strange solution for technical risk. However, we won't take the benefit for all. And this is the reason that I'm here, because we think that we work together, and especially we need to be capable to cooperate between the countries. Sometimes we try to define our national strategy, but this national strategy depends 
of our ideology. However, that we think to do is to try to endorse to a strength all the bridge along the different country in order to work together. So I think that if we fight in order to increase the capacities of the vulnerable people, we're going to move on and we're going to get more benefit of all of these challenge that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Michael Bolle. He is the member of the management board of Bosch, a company which is increasingly a software company, a quite big com software company, and he's the CIO and CTO of Bosch. Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Michael Bolle. I'm <coughs> chief digital officer and chief technology officer of Bosch, and there's a uh, a big reason behind that, we um, are a strong player in the Internet of Things and actually the Internet of Things is a combination of the things world and the virtual world, the digital world and therefore we have both worlds in, in, in one person. And I would like to elaborate a little bit on the role and the importance of trust in the Internet of Things. And um, at uh, our initiative, uh, representatives of uh, leading international associations like the IEEE, like Digital Europe, Etsy, Eclipse Foundation, Trustable Technology, Platform Industry 4.0, the Industrial Internet uh, Consortium, and the Trusted, I, um, Trusted IoT Alliance met for the first Digital Trust Forum in Berlin in May this year. And the main focus of this gathering was to answer the question how to build safe, trust in digital systems. And in order to understand this, we all know that um, the global IoT market is significantly growing. So we see 250 billion US dollars revenues in already in next year. This is a growth of 35% year over year. And we cannot accept the situation in this um, growth and this development status that the overwhelming reaction in the public space is mistrust and fear. And in order to fight this common uh, notion, we have to find also technology and governance solutions uh, for that. And therefore, we established the Digital Trust Forum as a global initiative with a focus on enabling trusted digital solutions for connected, intelligent, physical products utilizing AI and the Internet of Things. And therefore, we talk about the AIoT and um, the uh, Digital Trust Forum is also inspired by the U European initiatives on AI and trust. And we firmly believe that this is the ideal time to establish such a format because the need for well-defined responsibilities and governance as a foundation for trust in the AIoT is obvious. And a key question addressed by the Digital Trust Forum is, how to enable trust in the AIoT by defining quality parameters, monitoring compliance, and therefore formalized AIoT trust policies will be at the heart of operationalizing this managed by a trust policy management system. The idea is that by formalizing trust policies for AIoT systems, trustworthiness can be established because all policies are made transparent the system can access the currently valid policy definitions remotely in real time and use the data to control system performance. The system behavior from a trustworthiness perspective can be locked and published and trust can be efficiently enforced by managing system exceptions and escalations. And together with our strong partners, our company is set out to strengthen the confidence and digitization and its poss possibilities in the future. However, we know that we not only need policymakers as partners, we also want to support them with concrete proposals from an industry perspective. The Digital Trust Forum will aim to define a holistic policy framework to address all key aspects of digital trust in AIoT-based solutions. And this framework will include a set of AIoT trust policy categories, 
a data scheme to manage instances of AIoT trust policy definitions and a catalog of reference definitions for AIoT trust policies based on said schema. We look forward to discussing these and other questions during the upcoming next Bosch Connected World in Berlin in February 2020, where we will continue our discussions in the Digital Trust Forum. And I would like to cordially invite you to this event as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn to my left now. Um, what is the view of a think tank? You, <laughs> I think um, you did a lot of research uh, in, in earlier times uh, on human rights and copyright, but uh, you're now deep into these subjects. Um, you're from... Um, yes. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Polina, and I'm a policy advisor for Center, which is the association by and for European country code top-level domain registries, such as .de for Germany, for example, or .eu for European Union. And um, yes, thank you for this opportunity for be at this panel. And um, yes, yeah, so I represent technical community. And um, when we speak about cybersecurity, uh, we need to make an important distinction. So first, there is crime committed online, facilitated by the internet, and second, there is criminal activity that is aimed at disrupting internet infrastructure, including domain name system. And uh, country code top level domain registries, and CCTLDs for short, are technical operators of our cornerstone of the internet infrastructure, that is the domain name system. And as technical operators, they cannot assess whether any crime has or has not been uh, conducted online. The investigation and prosecution of any legal activity on the internet should be left for competent public authorities. However, within their technical capacity and expertise, CCTLDs are actively taking measures to tackle mere technical security threats. So, for example, uh, botnets, uh, phishing or farming, or malware distribution. And these security threats are targeted at abusing technical internet infrastructure. And this is where CCTLDs have the necessary expertise and capacity to respond while still actively cooperating with public authorities and within the limits of the local legal frameworks. Furthermore, uh, CCTLDs are continuously working on making sure that their zones are reliable, stable, and secure. And, uh, for example, in the last two years, investments into security amongst European CCTLDs have increased to an additional 30%. So this is by adopting relevant standards, uh, performing legal regular audits, and incre increasing their in-house security expertise. So when it comes to a global resource like uh, the internet and the cybersecurity threats within um, the all stakeholders within uh, internet ecosystem have shared responsibility. So uh, it's governments, technical actors, private sector, and to some extent even users. That doesn't mean that all these responsibilities are shared uh, equally or identically. And uh, each of those actors uh, can act within, the rem within their own remits, whether it's technical, legal, or societal. And consequently, when it comes to the technical core and the cybersecurity threats within, uh, these need to be addressed by increased collaboration and information sharing between partners. So, for example, responsible disclosure policies of shared vulnerabilities, sharing um, best practices and information on security threats and working together on global standards within technical fora. And last but not least, I think also that the uh, importance of education should not be underestimated. Uh, there's often some, um, to some extent, uh, some part of social engineering involved behind what at first glance seems to be a technical cyber, cyber threat. As so continuous uh, training of staff, uh, raising public awareness and uh, educating local internet communities is a, is a necessary building block to make sure that there is greater security online. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very good overview of the entire program. Let's go to standards. We heard 
more about uh, standards and different uh, remarks. Uh, Mina Hanna is the I uh, IEEE representative, and he knows best about standards in this circle, I think. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, very honored to be here on this panel uh, with my very esteemed speakers. Um, I, I really appreciate the kind mention of the IEEE by Herr Bola and Secretary Schreyer. And um, I, I will probably say, first of all, the introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Mina Hanna. I am the chair of policy of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of AI Systems. I'm also the chair um, of the IEEE USA Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems Policy Committee. Um, the IEEE, of course, had, you know, as you may have heard with the IGF and other organizations like ICANN, um, had a very important role in defining or creating the infrastructure that enabled the internet. Um, the internet, of course, is built on technology that a lot of it was the result of investments of, you know, large investments of government, like the US government, for example. The internet, the prior to that, the prior version of it was ARPANET that was a creation of the Department of Defense. Um, on top of it, there were a lot of protocols that were invented to facilitate the commerce and sharing of data and so on and so forth, like the TCP IP, uh, you know, Wi-Fi standards that IEEE had created, uh, the 802.11 and all of its varieties from A to, I don't know however many letters we have now. Um, but, you know, those standards, and, and on top of that too, you know, that entire infrastructure is not just technology, it's conventions, it's diplomacy, it's agreements, it's a lot of multi-stakeholder efforts to govern what is exchanged on, you know, on the internet and so on and so forth. Now, in the Global Initiative, we have noted, and of course that was, you know, driven by the fast progress and development of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, which, you know, without too much guessing, you'll probably be able to conclude that uh, the pervasiveness of many of these technologies and how they are so ubiquitous in our lives, um, you know, and the AI, uh, AI, AI uh, IoT um, enabled a lot of, you know, or will enable now and more in the future, we will see the, the, the increasing, you know, growth of more vulnerabilities, for example, cyber vulnerabilities will create, you know, a larger sphere for, um, uh, you know, cyber vulnerabilities that, that would actually be a, quite a bit of a threat to, you know, what we have built over the past 20 plus years, um, you know, uh, in resilient and, and safe and secure, you know, global supply chains, for example, which makes that a very, you know, kind of a big threat to global economies and the free flow of data, free flow of commerce and free flow of the internet. Um, so with that in mind, the Global Initiative is working on developing standards uh, and certification processes to certify um, the, the you know, problem, you know, due diligence processes, for example, how companies work with each other. Um, and the aim of that is to increase the transparency, accountability, and trustworthiness of, of AI and essentially IoT in general. And, you know, the Global Initiative has been, um, you know, we have invested heavily in the Global Initiative to build that very large community. The community now is engaging with a lot of governments. Um, you know, we are, of course, here today at the IGF. Um, IEEE USA, for example, advises policymakers in the U.S. on AI policy, internet policy, cybersecurity policy, and so on. Um, and the Global Initiative, we've, you know, through it, we have engaged a lot with the OECD, the high-level expert group of, um, you know, uh, in Europe. Um, and we, you know, we're, we were one of the first organizations that published, you know, principles for uh, trustworthy, you know, AI and so on. Now, I will say that perhaps maybe, and this is my personal uh, worry, is that what I'm most concerned about is we, what we might see, you know, in terms of balkanization of technology in the future. Um, it seems that we have, you know, I don't know if you, if you really want to call it, it's kind of a catch word, but like the AI race and so on. Um, you know, well, we're seeing that there are some different schools of thoughts on what are the values that should govern the internet, that should gover, govern what we do with AI tools and autonomous decision-making systems that have implications, and we're going to talk too much about that during the next four days uh, on human rights and civil rights and so on. Now, if I were to pick on something that um, 
Mr. Kayser had said in his, the CEO and chairman of, of Siemens that, has, that he has said in his opening uh, keynote, he said, now is the time that we define the rules. And by the rules, I hope, and I know that he meant standards, and on, you know, on other things, of course. Um, you know, the multi-stakeholder dialogue that raises the awareness of all of the community that have to be involved in order to weigh in with the values that they understand are critical and important. And that, of course, is the role of, you know, um, the speakers here, everybody who was in IGF, essentially critical role for diplomacy, signing conventions, and having more and more engagements and dialogues. And we look forward that we will stay more engaged in that, um, you know, reach out to us, work with us, and we're, we have a lot of collaborators and we continue, you know, that collaboration, hopefully to solve that, um, that you know, problem and challenge. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Finally, we have Aaron Brown. He's a data center architect, so he knows best how to really protect our data. And we are coming back to the technical level, I suppose. Um, I'm going to stay on the policy level, and I'm going to steer away from technology. I'm, uh, okay. My name is Aaron Brown. I'm the uh, CTO for MAI, at a company named Infinidat. Um, two points you mentioned throughout the panel that I want to tie into. Number one, you mentioned $6 trillion in investment and damages expected from cybersecurity. So we're spending a lot of money and will be still accumulating a lot of damage. Um, under GDPR, NYDFS, and various standards and regulations, we call on enterprises, corporations, to protect the PII, the personally identifiable information of the data subjects, and that's important. However, I feel we're lacking in encouraging companies to protect their own data. If a lot of that cyber damage comes from intellectual property theft, and a lot of that theft is through social engineering, through the human element, we have to devise our systems to design for failure. That means we have to encourage corporations to not only encrypt data that will get them a fine of up to 4% of their turnover, but also to encourage them to encrypt the data that may cause them to go bankrupt because somebody else, a company in another country, stole their intellectual property and can now compete with them without the cost of R&D to get there. So point number one is we have to start looking at how do, what data needs encryption beyond just personally identifiable information. What critical infrastructures or critical technologies will be potentially stolen from companies? And we see data breaches at the orders of hundreds per year. And that number keeps going up and up. And it's a human element. So number one, let's encrypt more data to protect our intellectual property. Number two is the human element of that. And here I could not have a higher level of agreement with Polina, who said we have to have education. In Israel, they ran a study. 94% um, of all images and videos shared by pedophiles comes from jeopardized mobile devices. That's a terrible number because we don't have digital hygiene, because we don't teach kids how to protect themselves online. A couple of years ago, as part of a volunteering project I do, I started working with um, about 20-year-olds to um, make them more aware of what is being done with their data online. It takes quite a few minutes at the beginning of this training to get them to understand that, for example, for a company like Facebook, they are the product. Their data is getting sold. And they're using these tools for years. They were kind of born into the digital revolution. And they have no idea what's happening behind it. They have no idea how to protect their accounts from password theft, for example. We are missing one element that is completely not technology. It's education. How do we build educational programs that will make the end user in the enterprise more resilient to phishing and that will make the next generation, our kids, our grandkids, more resilient to social engineering. We're seeing cases of bank, uh, bank money theft. We're thinking, seeing social accounts getting locked out by hackers. A lot of our lives are not digital. We have to start thinking about educating younger generations on how to protect them. That will also have a great side effect of having better educated employees in the organizations and enterprises and commercial sector. But in this context, I treat it as a great side effect. 
94% of pedophilia online comes from jeopardized devices. That alone should trigger action from our side. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that was an, another extremely important aspect, the human factor. Um, we are always overlooking uh, when it comes to this technologies. Given the time pressure, uh, I'm not asking questions, but I open the floor for one or two questions uh, to the audience. So who likes to pose a question to our distinguished panel? Please. Do we have a mic there? or Yes, we do. Just wait. <laughs> Maybe you could introduce yourself briefly. Uh, my name is Walter Natwis. I run at this point an IGF pilot project on internet standards and the deployment of internet standards or the lack of deployment. I've got one question. If we all agree that something needs to happen, how do we get these standards or education, et cetera, rolling? That is one, but how do we deal with the bad actors that will never comply to anything we agree with? So there's two questions. How do we go forward from here? Is an action plan, but two is how do we deal with the bad actors? Thank you. Who, who likes, please? Yeah, I, I think the first question is uh, very clear. You know, that uh, for global service, global connectivity, we need a global standards. And uh, we, ITU, work together with IGBE, IETF uh, for uh, for industrial standards, and we support the uh, global connectivity. And in ITU, we also take care of the intellectual property pr uh, protections, so IT, IPRs and ITRs. And this, uh, I think that definitely we have uh, already some uh, observations that, uh, you know, when we see some uh, market uh, failure, that uh, they don't respect the global standards or something like that. And then we, we, we know that uh, this kind of a commercial dispute could be sometimes picked up by uh, our sister organization like WTO and uh, WIPO, you know that. But anyhow, uh, we would like to encourage to have uh, global standards for global services. And uh, we, we work with uh, industries, for example, uh, in IGBE, IETF, uh, Qualcomm, Intel, they all you know, come to IETU to, uh, to, to, to address the concerns of uh, global standards. And uh, we try to you know, to you know, to make a, uh, additional or stronger efforts to to encourage them to continue to work on the standard global standards for uh, in the benefit of uh, end users. Thank you. Thank you. I think Michael Bolle wants yeah, to so add I something. Have, I have, I have one, um, let's say, comment uh, com uh, to your to your question. I think if we look at the various uh, standardization efforts, which are um, done in the various groups uh, which are sitting here on the panel or which have been present also in our digital trust forum, it's clear that there needs to be a stronger uh, coordination uh, between those uh, activities in order to make them really uh, tangible and, and more successful at the end. Um, for example, if you, if you think about um, the, the various activities which my colleague already mentioned uh, in the impact of artificial intelligence, also to cybersecurity and, and the other aspects, I think we need a, a global view and an aligned also policy making. Uh, behind those things. So what is done, for example, in the IEEE about ethics of AI, what is done in, in, in Europe has to be coordinated to a certain extent so that we have a, a, a common view on the basic principles and this holds for the, for the other aspects as well. And therefore, um, we think from an industry perspective, we need to create, let's say, some kind of forums and exchange formats in order to bring those various standardization experts together and drive forward more, more holistic approaches to that. And um, the, the other aspect I would like to mention is that clearly industry uh, has to take um, a, um, a more active role in, in, in this uh, standardization activities as well. Well, thank you very much. I'm already reminded that we're eating up too much time. So I have to close that panel, I'm sorry. Um, let's give a hand to these distinguished panelists. I think we, we covered a very comprehensive 
set of themes. Um, so uh, I'm not uh, summarizing this, and I wish you a very successful IGF. Thank you.
Can we start now? Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, a warm welcome to the next uh, breakout session. So, we are talking about transaction and trust. And I know we are the last stop before having lunch. And um, thank you very much for having also a very interesting fe my fellows on the panelists. My name is Stephanie Kemp. Uh, I'm a non-exec on the advisory board for the Eco Association, the Internet Economy in Germany. And I have the pleasure to moderate a very interesting session. And we would like to have it a bit more on the fly, a change, because uh, one of my colleagues here on stage, Mr. Engels from BASF, is not joining us. And that's the reason why we do not have really someone gives us an input. I would like to do a brief framing on our session. So we are talking about uh, that uh, uh, cyber crime and cyber breaches are increasingly increasing. And our problem here today is, do we really find uh, rules or do we would like to have policies, standard policies, in place and what does it mean from the various angles. So I'm very pleased that I have um, Elius Civils here today, our uh, Deputy Minister of Digitization from Lithuania. Then, thank you. Um, unexpected, Mark is again here. Uh, Mark is representing the insurance company Ergo, yeah, is my understanding. The next one is Maximilian Teintal. Uh, Maximilian, thank you. Then I have Gertrud Livien on stage. Gertrud will give us a bit more an overview of best practices here today. Then I have Thomas Rosenbeck on stage. And I have uh, Christian Mir here. And finally, uh, today uh, on the fly, I had the change of Mr. Shen Yi from China. So uh, up from the panel, we decided that everyone will have a very short introduction of himself or herself. And just give me um, a small uh, frame of what is your touch point to this topic. And I would like to start here on my left side, Mr. Shen Yi, if you would like to start with it. Uh, surprising and uh, come here. I think it's, the, my, it's my first time to be the IGF. And I'm coming from the universities, uh, serve as kind of uh, research on these cybersecurity things. My background is information and uh, international relations. So I'd like to talk about these things in the background or the framework of international series. In the series of these international relations, we talk about norms, mechanisms a lot. This kind of norms and mechanisms, the main functions is to regulate the different actors' behaviors to make their behaviors more predictable, more stable, and finally lead to a kind of consistent, stable cooperations among different actors. And the second, I think such kind of norms, of course, is very important to the cyberspace, especially in today's world. In today's world, just like Professor Joseph Nye mentioned, that these ICT revolutions happen in an environment which we don't have enough trust among the main actors, which means the state actors. While simultaneously, it's very interesting to find out the development of ICT and the cyberspace depend heavily on whether these actors can have enough trust and cooperation with each other. So it's kind of very interesting paradox games. On one side, these, these actors, they compete. The computer will have more influence to enjoy more advantages. On the other side, all these actors, their behaviors must be limited into some certain margins, which means that during these competitions, you should not completely destroy all these cyberspace. Yes, if you unilaterally enjoy these advantages too much, you destroy the basic trust, no global cyberspace, and no these games, and then with no internet. So it's very interesting games. And during the third, during these procedures, norms are very important. Such kind of norms, I think there are three very important characteristics. First, equities. Second, systematic. Thirdly, balanced. It should be very important to notice, last not least, these kind of norms should only serve this minority or unilateral actors' uh, profits. It must meet the uh, benefits for the actors as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Christian, um, from the Reporters Without Borders, may I can just ask a question on what are the relevant cyber breaches you see here today? The relevant what? What are the relevant cyber breaches you see oh. today? 
I mean, relevant cyber breaches, I see, first of all, quite overarching thing that we, from Reporters at Borders, we are a human rights organization defending the human right to press freedom and freedom of information, but the whole environment has been changing in last year, and we have a discussion on trust and distrust into media, and so this is actually the, the fundamental layer for, for, for press freedom, and so for us, this is really a breach, I would say, is that we have all over the world discussions on trust into media and the, the aim um, which we as Reporters Without Borders currently are facing is that we, we are thinking about how to create trust signals in the information and communication global space and that's why we developed, we initiated actually a, a bit of IGF style multi-stakeholderism approach, a so-called journalism trust initiative, which is actually a European standard, um, which in the idea is, um, which is this, in the end should be a trusted third party me mechanism to, to, to incentivize media outlets that respective journalistic methods and ethics can be prioritized by by um, in algorithmic indexation, and that's why we, in the last year, we had a procedure a discussion with several stakeholders. Um, and it's important that Facebook, Google, they participated in the project and they even registered for it. A, a multi-stakeholder um, approach with media, with with associations, and uh, moreover, as I said, Facebook, Google, which is important. And we aim that actually this. Um, prioritization in the algorithmus indexation in the end will lead to some more trust if people can identify better some ethics and principles but what is important um, we don't have the aim to judge any content um, it's just about ethics and principles because we as a human rights organization we are not defending any content and so the question of Trust is for us really a major uh, 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 distrust, actually the growing distrust is a major breach. Thank you very much. So I would like to um, go to um, uh, Mr. Uh, to Ilios. Ilios, um, when we had a f very easy chat before having this panel here today, and I really like your question, um, you would like to raise me, do you feel secure in the internet? Well, um I think this is a relevant question for all of us. Um, me personally, I feel secure, but uh, if I think of uh, my main stakeholders, like my grandmother or my mother or my kids, I don't think they feel uh, very much secure. And this is because of this mystification about this cyber security, cyber crime, and everyone talking, you know, about the digital skills. So <clears throat> the problem is that um, <clears throat> on one hand, we are like in the government we are focused very much on the digital enabled services. So in Lithuania, we have 86% uh, of all the citizens and 90 something percent of all the enterprises that engage the government through the digital channels only. So in other words, everyone is uh, talking to us digitally, but then not everyone is having enough understanding what's happening in the digital space. So in the government, in the past, we were so much focused on the digital skills. So what it means, it means like basically training my grandma to, to do programming. But it's not about programming, right? It's about how do they understand their identities in the digital space, how they understand the ethics, how they understand, you know, the rights on the digital space. So I think the digital intelligence is what we are really aiming at. And if we increase that with the society, then I think we mitigate a lot of, lot of those crimes as well. Thank you. So Maximilian. Just to my right, um, the founder of this C uh, and CFO of N26 GmbH, what are you exactly doing? Um, N26 is a fintech startup based in Berlin. We founded the company in 2013. Um, today, I think we employ about 1,500 people. The idea behind N26 has always been to build a pan-European bank, the vision behind N26. So we're the only ones today that based on one IT platform and one banking license onboard customers all over Europe. Like that vision has become bigger lately. Today we want to build the first global 
retail bank we just launched in the US um, from New York with other markets to follow. So what's the product of N26? We are providing a digital first uh, bank account. So we are providing a product for millennials that like to do things on the smartphone after we actually realized that while well, there's a massive shift in user behavior, like from offline to online to mobile. So in our world, people used to go to the bank branch, then they did banking um, on the browser, now they do banking on the smartphone, and we realized that no bank pretty much throughout the world is really providing a great product, a great digital use experience for um, people that like to do things online and on their smartphones. And that's kind of the niche we're tapping into. I think we have four and a half million customers today, and we're the fastest growing bank in Europe. And my understanding here is if you are working as an online banking, um, does it mean are there specific challenges um, how to I would like to say um, prevent cyber <laughs> or um, internet breaches from your point of view to I would like to say establish and provide a secure business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like we obviously like in a business and there we are not different to to other banks where we're dealing with the most private data of the customer and we're dealing um, with the customer's money. So. Um, security, keeping this data private and keeping the money safe is um, an intrinsic part of the business. Like if you lose data, if you lose money, you can just go home and do something else. I think also in terms, and there was a lot of thought about that, like at N26, um, we're not really advertising with security because uh, I think one, it's not a, a place where you can really differentiate yourself from other banks. I think traditionally, like, like also banks, there's no way to claim that um, the money at a traditional bank is less safe than at N26. But obviously, like for customer, trust is a very important part of the metric. And how do you generate trust? Um, it is this obvious, obviously around the service. It is about predictability, but it's also about safety and security. So what we're doing at N26, um, we are basically maintaining the standards of modern technology companies. So we are having a big internal security team. Uh, we have a bug bounty program where hackers are being incentivized to find flaws in our, in our code. Basically, they try to attack our systems, like the friendly kind of hackers. And if they find something like Google and, and all the other, like Facebook, all the other companies are having the same concept. You get a bigger premium if you find something at Google than at N26, but um, you get a premium. We do penetration testing, so we engage into external hackers to try to hack our systems. And first, they start with zero information, um, trying to, to hack in from the outside, trying to park uh, on the parking lot, trying to lock into our um, network, then it would walk in, try to find a laptop, and then you give them more and more information, like finally that they are on the level of information, um, like some, some frustrated former employee. Uh, so that's just part of our, of our like, uh, security systems we have in place. I think most important to know in our world, the weakest spot is always um, the customer. So um, there's a lot of social engineering going on, and uh, I think companies like N26 that have an easy account opening process are even more likely to get targeted. But there's a lot of education uh, to the customer how you can actually prevent of being like, um, uh, like used as a tool to, to open accounts, for example, that are later used for fraud or for terrorism um, financing. So preventing fraud and financial crime um, is, is, is a very like, important or has to be a very important point for us. While we fully understand it's not a big factor of, the, of differentiation. So I, th I don't think you can actually win the game by being the most secure, but you can definitely lose the game by making any major mistake in that regard. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, being um, the digital uh, president of the business unit of the digital security solutions at Enfinion, the weakest point is the customer. How do you feel about that? And what does it mean for you also acting as an international organization? Yeah, right. Perhaps the, the first question, what does a semiconductor manufacturer, so being somewhere deep in the, in the products, uh, what, what do we do here, right, on this forum? I think it's a, um, beside, besides mobility and energy efficiency, security is the main theme of, of Infineon and trying to make the world 
uh, safer in this regard. So if you talk about the customer, coming back to this uh, question and also what, what you said um, about your grandma, it's a question, we, I think we are expecting way too much from the consumer. We are not expecting, for example, that you have to be an engineer to drive a car, right? Because we assume that a car is secure. So we have to trust in, in that. Right? If it comes to trust in the, in the field of, of uh, internet security, it's about two questions. The first question is, do you want to protect me? And are you able to protect me? So assuming N26 wants to protect me, that, then that's about the capabilities. Are you able to protect me? And this is where we can, can then play a role and try to get, um, get things in. And there are some fundamental standards like security by design and also what, uh, what Mr. Kesa this morning said, in, um, it's about the trusted value chain. Do I know what kind of products I use and where they're coming from? So you see it get, it's got a bit of a different, different angle to, to other, um, other statements here. Um, but it's about, it's about what is the foundation of, um, of, of what we do. So today we already do that. So we trust devices, you trust devices. So for example, every second credit card you have in your pocket has a chip from us. So you trust us already. If you are traveling with, with, a, with a passport, you are trusting us already. And it's about, it's about this, this root of trust and this anchor of trust, I think, that we have, have to work on. And uh, I think it was already touched today, which I deem very important, is the question of, um, of standardization. Right? We, need, we need standards for security also around the world, and we need one standard preferably, not 25, because then, then, it's, then it's not going to going to work. And I think from that perspective, this, these are things that we are driving uh, heavily on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's what, what our role is in this game. Thank you. So I'm a bit confused because the door is open and it's a bit crowding. Can you please close the door so far as long we have the panel? No, 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 we have, uh, sorry, we have a delay in here. Yeah, just started. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Andre. No, sir. Come on. Andre, one more question. Um, being the chair of the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, what does it mean? Disruptive is a strong word in there, right? Okay, I think we're going to try to hack the session still. I mean, a little comment with a lot of appreciation for all the people working hard for the session. We hear, it's a bit of political comment, so many calls about multilateralism. If the multilateral organizations are not able to organize events that work well and are efficient, we are cooked. I mean, Uli, this Uli. is a very, and I hope the journalists Thank you for or the, the media, I mean, it's a disgrace, I'm sorry. Huh? Bon. So, uh, a quick, a quick response on that. Uh, ju just uh, the, the initiative I'm heading is the European equivalent to DARPA. So basically trying to invent the next big thing and not just trying to, to run after the others. A, a few points. One, um, which is important, is, is um, the, the topic of trust or ethics that we sometimes separate from, from technology. I mean, I could go much deeper into it, but basically today the technologies convey values. So you cannot develop... Uh, technologies without taking some stance. Think about face recognition, think about you know, open ar architecture or closed architecture, cl uh, think about fragmentation of the, of the internet. So uh, this is something very important because you cannot just say that, okay, we develop the technology and we let others do the, the, the ethics committee and so on. The second thing which is really my biggest concern, and maybe since we have some limited time, let's focus on the, on the key. We are entering the world of autonomous systems. We're entering the world where basically the complexity of our world has become m larger than we can just understand. The number of data, the number of emails, the number of WhatsApps. So if we don't have these autonomous systems, and especially in the response or um, in, the, in the preventive postures we can have to cyber attacks, we will increasingly run after the threats. And I must say, and this has a third consequence, 
I'm not so sure that we will be able to establish one standard or one committee because you will increasingly have, we need to think much more like the tech world is thinking in ecosystems. That means we need to have an ability to have regulations which pop up that are adapted to a special threat. If they are very adapted to a specific situation, then they are taken over by, but this myth which is still very European, huh? to think, okay, we can have one single standard. Uh, I always give this example of GDPR, and I'm sorry because people who listened to me yesterday, uh, they, they heard that again, but it took us five years to do GDPR. Five years ago, it was great. Today, you realize that actually it acts like a barrier of entry for those who have already massive data, and it acts like a incredible um, complexity for the smaller firms who want, to, who want to enter the data business. So actually, GDPR today promotes monopolies in the data business and not the opposite. So this is also a call for, for, for policymakers, is can we go to governance systems which are much more on experimentation, try out the regulation, and, and not just sandboxes, because sandboxes are often a, a, an excuse for not actually scaling it, but really giving it an opportunity to go much faster and act in months and weeks. Otherwise, the risk is those who will be in advance on technology threats and, and look at, I mean, the Bundestag was just hacked a year, uh, a month, a year ago by, uh, by a young 20-year-old out of Frankfurt with, who used, a, a, um, who used a, a, an issue with Vista. Very simple, took, I think, uh, BSI uh, one or two months to, to identify the cause of this hacking. Imagine those hacks that will be much more driven on autonomous systems with some kind of AI embedded. If we are not able to react much faster, and, and then increasingly we will we will we have, will have this feeling that we lose it. And your grandmother, instead of feeling more and more secure, she actually will have the feeling that the, the, she will have increasingly less impact on the world around her. And that makes me worry, not just about this little elite group that convenes here, but about much larger population that feel that technology is a threat to them. And that's my biggest worry. Thank you. Um, before um, going to Gertrude, she will give us um, a very short overview of best practices. I would like to ask Mark tough words. We are not able to implement any kind of norms, I would like to say internationally or European-wide, as Andre mentioned. What do you think about from the ergo perspective as a CDO? Yeah, very good question. First of all, let me just say one thing about the cyber risks that we see in the market. For us, they are really... Uh, exponentially growing and they come with two flavors and that is important to understand. The first thing is on the B2B side, so companies, we see more and more devices being connected and at the moment you have the smartphone, you have the laptop, you have your company network but we heard from Bosch that you will have all the IoT devices, they will all be a, a potential to basically enter your company and uh, start the cyber crime. Nevertheless, we don't insure much there in the B2B space in Germany, close to zero. It's 90% in the US market because the government is basically saying you have to. So you see that the awareness, even, even with the companies, is not there. The second flavor is the B2C market. And here um, I see, and we had it on the last panel, I see especially the young ones being heavily at risk. There it's also a bit pishing and uh, a bit uh, um, social engineering, but also the whole thing about cyber mobbing. I think every second kid in Germany has basically experience with cyber mobbing. The speech gets harder and basically we are not supporting our kids to, to basically cope with that. Yeah, when I have a daughter that is 13, she's going to school, the plan is the same than I had. No media competence, nothing. And I think we have a lot to do. But even here, do we have a standard for that in Germany? No. Do we have a standard in Europe? It's very, it's very difficult. We are not pushing for that, even though we know. Even though we are talking on the panels that the cyber risk is exploding, we don't have the awareness by companies. And I'm not talking, I think that Bosch and Infineon, you know that. You have certain packages, you are insured. But the SMB market is basically uninsured. And they don't have the awareness. When it happens, it is too late, and then they lose a lot. 
But currently, I think what we have to do, and here I would also see support from uh, governmental initiatives and being it for the, for the school system in Germany to create more awareness on this kind of topics. Because they are there and we are just at the beginning. Believe me, the number of connected devices will explode and with this, the cyber risk will explode. Whether we want it or not, the attacker has a clear advantage and the defender has a disadvantage because there are more points to enter. Thank you, Mark. Gertrude. As the Digital Health Manager for the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, um, you offered to give us a short overview of a best practice example, and a key question for me is who will benefit from that? Well, um, I think that the primary beneficiary of verified top-level domains will be the billions of internet users who can find safe online spaces by, by using verified top-level domains and the websites within them. Um, but first I need to back up a little bit and talk about what a, what a verified top-level domain is. Um, so I'm here to talk about verified top-level domains and the role they play in, in promoting online safety and trust. So the current online environment is one where um, the end users really have to beware of fraudulent and deceptive websites. Um, and they're prevalent. So for instance, 95% of websites selling prescription drugs online are doing so illegally. Um, phishing incidents were up 68% or 41%, I'm sorry, in, uh, in 2018. And banking scams compose about a third of all phishing scams globally. Um, so verified TLDs are one answer to um, fraud and deception online. And the Verified TLD Consortium was established in 2016 to create safe online spaces for end users and to give commercial registrants a way to stand out as legitimate and, and trustworthy. Um, the consortium is an informal voluntary association of registry operators for generic top-level domains and the third parties that administer or support them. Its mission is to enhance public trust and online safety and e-commerce by promoting the value of TLDs and raising <coughs> awareness about TLDs as trusted channels for products, services, and communications online, and that's specifically verified TLDs. Um, members of the consortium require certain safeguards, um, and those include pre-verification of registrants before they're able to use a domain name, um, for instance, uh, registry operators will verify um, who, verify that the registrant is who they say they are and that they have the proper credentials to register a domain within that TLD. Um, members of the consortium also require that registrants within the TLD adhere to standards. Um, as defined in the registration policies. For instance, that might include appropriate credentials and so forth. Um, verified top-level domains also engage in online monitoring to ensure continued compliance with registration policies and continued eligibility. And should, the, should, it, should it be the case that a domain ceases to be in compliance with these standards. Verified TLDs maintain the um, autonomy to take back the name. Um, do I have time to present a couple of use cases? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, dot pharmacy is one such use case. It is um, operated by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and um, it requires an application to uh, first establish eligibility to register a domain within that top level domain. Um, it requires compliance with 
juris with uh, pharmacy laws in the jurisdiction where it's based, as well as where its customers live. Um, in the process um, of, uh, of this verification, it creates a safe online space for consumers to rest assured that the medications or information or services that they're obtaining online are authentic and safe. Another use case is FTLD, which is the registry operator for dot bank and dot insurance. Um, these are also verified TLDs, and um, they require that um, that registrants be pre-verified to ensure that they are um, registered or chartered with the appropriate governmental regulatory authority. Um, so in that case, they are providing an online space for um, companies and their customers uh, where that are that's more secure and reliable. Um, so operating a, TL, a verified TLD does not come without a cost. Um, verification is very resource intensive um, because verified TLDs tend to serve niche markets. Verification registration volume tends to be a tends to be lower than it would be in, in uh, registries that are completely open to anyone. Um, and not all registrars work with verified top-level domains, but the members of the Verified Top-Level Domains Consortium um, feel that those costs are outweighed by the benefits. And, um, those benefits include, um, well, the fact that costs can be offset by higher fees. Um, verified TLDs are gaining recognition within their respective communities. And abuse is practically unheard of in a verified TLD. And perhaps most importantly, um, they promote safety, reliability, 